So in the previous lecture, I characterized game theoretic modeling and the social sciences as something akin to writing fables. That isn't my idea. It comes from an economist, a well-known game theorist named Ariel Rubinstein, who has a book entitled Economic Fables that is free on his website. And if you're more interested in that idea, you can try to find that book. It's, it's, a, it's a fun read, actually. Although, you might want to wait until the end of the class um, so you have a better sense about what the fables look like before you start talking about the nature of fables. One thing that's really important for us to pause to acknowledge for a week is that all of the game theoretic modeling that we'll be doing for the remainder of the class um, relies on a more foundational fable. The foundational fable of the rational actor. What's remarkable about this fable is that it comes in three versions. Um, and actually, this happens pretty often. So there are a couple of morality fables that emerge in several different cultures, right? So it's my rough understanding that there are a couple of different cultures that developed a fable of a little girl that had to walk through some woods to visit her grandmother and that got into some trouble, right? Um, to Westerners, this is known as Little Red Riding Hood. Uh, and likewise, with the, with the fable of the rational actor, there are three related fables that we're going to talk about today. And I say related in a very deep sense. We're going to try to identify assumptions under which each fable is equivalent to the other two. That's kind of amazing when you think about it. So we're going to talk about three related fables about what rationality is. And then at the end, we'll double back and try to think a little bit more substantively. But it's an exciting enough topic that we should just dive right in. So in the A block, we will talk about probably the most basic version of what a rational actor looks like. Um, and it's the, the, the version of the fable in which preferences are encoded through a binary relation that sort of ranks all the alternatives. So you give a set of alternatives, and it returns a ranking that says, for any two of them, I prefer one to the other, right? So if you give me Coke, Pepsi, and Sprite, maybe I would say I prefer Coke to Sprite, Coke to Pepsi, and Sprite to Pepsi. You know, so it's a bunch of little binary comparisons. The, so the, the main thing about the first version of the fable is it's all binary comparisons between alternatives. Excellent. In the B block, we'll talk about utility maximization, which is probably the most used version. It is the most famous fable in this family of fables. Points for alliteration, right? It's the most famous fable in this family of fables, and fairly so, because I'm out of Fs it's very easy to use. So it is probably the substantively weakest of the three fables. It's the least plausible, it's the most laughable of the three rationality fables we'll be talking about, but it's the most convenient to use in other models. Utility maximization is probably the version of rationality that you've seen in papers the most. It's certainly the version that is the most caricaturized. Um, by people that feel like characterizing rational choice theory. And then as a bonus, and you're like, oh boy, a bonus, in the C block, we'll talk about the version of the fable in which there is no reason why a given choice is made. All that we do is observe choices. And the question is, what are patterns of rational choice when we don't understand the underlying motivations of the decision maker and are only evaluating their choices? That one is easily the hardest to work with, but it's also the only of the three that's empirically verifiable. I could ask you if you like Coke more than Pepsi, but I don't know what part of your brain is working. I don't know. I'm not a neuroscientist. Nobody's a neuroscientist. I mean, plenty of people are neuroscientists, but remarkably few social scientists are thinking about the brain that deeply. Exceptions exist. This rational choice version is the only one of the three that if you were interested in working in a laboratory to figure out how people work, it's the only one that would be of immediate use to you. The others would require all sorts of different machinations to try to make things make sense. So we have a simple one, an embarrassingly simple one, and a complicated one. We have a plausible one, an entirely implausible one, and a pretty plausible one. And our goal is to figure out when the three fables tell the same story. Let's get started. So we're going to start with what are called binary preference relations. So a binary relation is just a generalization of the idea of things that you see in between two elements, right? So you might see that 3 is equal to 3, and that 
in the that thing in the middle, that equal sign, that comes between two different elements called three, and it spits out a statement. Is it true that three is equal to three? Yes. We could have put two equal to three, and then based on how we define the relation, we know that two isn't equal to three, so that would spit out a false. So a binary relation is just the relation that is described between two elements in a statement of that form. Three is greater than two. Three is equal to three. So we, we come in with some set in mind, be it numbers, and we have this relation on it. So for example, if, if you look at a family, is the mother of is a relation between two humans, right? So Rob is the mother of Chewy. Let's pretend that Chewy's a human, which isn't hard for me to do. Is not a true statement, but it is a statement, right? So it is logically false. Uh, and is the mother of that in the middle thing is the relation that renders it false. So is the best friend of that would be true because there's a different relation that I just plugged in between these same two elements. We're going to talk about properties of these relations. And so it's important to just have a rough sense about what's going on. And you're going to get plenty of practice with the relations themselves. In the fable of the binary preference relation, we have a decision maker and we're not going to know anything about the decision maker just yet. Um, and they are faced with a set of alternatives. Um, so throughout today's lecture, I'm going to write capital X, and that's going to be some set of alternatives, okay? To keep matters simple, we're just going to assume that X is a finite set. Um, so you can just gather, because that's what we do with sets, you can just gather a bunch of different alternatives. So the easiest way to proceed might be to actually come up with some physical manifestations. I'll be right back. So as a very simple example, maybe X is just the set of all beverages that are in my fridge. And so as of right now, that's a caramel premier. They tell me it's caramel. Who knows? Um, premier protein shake. Uh, Pomplemousse LaCroix. What the hell is Pomplemousse? There's a band called Pomplemousse that I like. What is Pomplemousse? And trusty dusty diet A and W. This is the finest beverage ever made by humans. Let's say that X is just a root beer, a pomplemousse water, and a protein shake. It doesn't have to be three alternatives in X. It can be four, five, six, dot, 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 however many you want. We could even do an infinite one, but it, that sort of makes the math harder and doesn't give you any particularly interesting insights at our level. So we're just going to assume that X is finite. It can have a whole lot. It can have billions and billions of elements if you wanted. It could have a Google or a Google Plex of elements if you wanted, but it's finite. That's the most important thing for today's lecture is we're just going to assume that the set of alternatives, capital X, is finite. So let me introduce a, a binary preference relation. So if you give me any two alternatives, I'll call them XI and XJ, where I could be equal to J. I didn't say any two distinct alternatives. So if you give me any two alternatives, XI and XJ, I'm going to use this squiggly symbol, the squiggly greater than or equal to sign, and the words that that's going to represent is, is at least as good as. So the idea is, there is that xi is at least as good as xj. And that's a statement that relies on both xi, xj, and the relation in question. So for example, I like diet A and W at least as much as I like pomplemousse LaCroix. So diet A and W is at least as good as pomplemousse LaCroix. Somehow, I also like caramel, fake caramel premier protein. There's a fable, the idea that this is actually caramel. Uh, fake caramel premier protein is at least as good as Pomplemousse LaCroix. So those are just statements about my preferences on these three elements in my set of alternatives right now, okay? For more political examples, maybe for a given voter, one party is at least as good as another party. Maybe for a person that's in Congress, the yay vote is at least as good as the nay vote. Um, maybe for a, a given country thinking about fighting a war, the expected war outcome is at least as good as the status quo. So all that we're saying here is take two things that you might experience, be it an alternative that you choose, or in game theory, an outcome that arises from multiple actors' choices. Uh, but in that set of outcomes, in that set of alternatives, squiggly greater than or equal to blank means at least as good as. I think that relations like these are also very nicely drawn 
um, with arrows and dots, not with blobs and dots and arrows. We're only going to be talking about one set, but it's not that hard to order a set using using this sort of thing. So suppose that I had, for example, maybe X has five elements in it. I'll call them A, B, C, D, and E. Why didn't I sing there? That was a missed opportunity. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Oh my God, I can't even sing that well. So suppose, for example, that I wanted to show in my picture that A was at least as good as B. Well, I could draw an arrow that goes from A to B. Or if I wanted to say that E was at least as good as E, something, it's at least as good as itself, then I would draw an arrow that started and ended at E, a little swirly like that. If I wanted to show that both C was at least as good as D and D was at least as good as C, I actually kind of prefer to look at two particular single arrows. It calls more attention to the fact that... So these arrows are a way of, in, of depicting the idea that A is at least as good as B, C is at least as good as D, D is at least as good as C, and E is at least as good as E. So you could start from a bunch of is at least as good as and make a picture, and you could also start from a picture and make a list of statements, okay? So these two things are very much the same thing. One, one gives you the other perfectly so. So let's keep looking at the picture because it, well, it's easier for me to draw. And also I think it keeps things more conceptual. I wanna talk about some properties that might emerge in the context of one of these pictures. So just to show you some of these properties, I'm gonna have a simple running stylized example with three alternatives, A, B, and C, okay? And the pictures that we draw with just these three dots will have a complete characterization over in the notation land. I just think it's easier to talk about the dots and not just is it easier to talk about the dots, it's easier to see the concepts that we're going to be imposing at work in the picture land. The math is just a, a, a precise way to define things. So I want to show you a property called reflexiveness. So we say that a relation on a set is reflexive if for every element x of the set, x is, bears the relation to x. Or a preference relation is reflexive if for every alternative x, x is at least as good as x, all right? So reflexive means that every element bears the relation to itself. So what does reflexiveness look like in our three dot example? Okay, well, it needs to be the case that for every alternative, that alternative is at least as good as itself. So suppose that I drew A is at least as good as A with this little arrow that starts and ends at A, a little swirly, okay? Is our property reflexive? No, why isn't it reflexive? Well, it needed to be the case that every alternative had an arrow that started and ended at itself. Every alternative was at least as good as itself. Diet A and W is at least as good as diet A and W. So this, this picture isn't there yet. If I added B to B, is it done? No, we needed for all. It needed to be the case that every dot that we drew had an arrow. So if we fill in the C arrow, now we have a, this is a preference relation that is reflexive. And that's going to be our first rationality postulate is that the decision maker over this finite set of alternatives, A, B, C, always thinks that an alternative is at least as good as itself. This is quite plausible. I would like for you to try to find something in your life, be it an outcome or an alternative, that you like strictly more than itself. It's not gonna happen, okay? This is not a controversial assumption. Diet A and W is at least as good as diet A and W. It's not, right? Let me repeat that. Diet A and W is as good as diet A and W, right? It's not better than itself. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Everything should be as good as itself. That's what we're saying when we have this reflexive property. Our second rationality postulate is going to be that the decision maker has complete preferences. That extends this idea of reflexiveness so that it's not just every alternative to itself, it's going to be every alternative to every other alternative. What do I mean by that? 
Well, we say that a, re a preference relation is complete if for every pair of alternatives, either the first is at least as good as the second, the, the second is at least as good as the first, or both. So what does that mean? It means substantively that you're never allowed to say, I don't know. So what does that mean? That means that if you gave our decision maker, that's me, if you gave them a Diet A&W and a Pomplemousse water, how tired of you with the word Pomplemousse, and you said, hey, you know, which, which of these do you like more than the other? They'd look at it and they'd say, yeah, I don't know. Um, and that that's reasonable, right? I mean, I, I'm saying it somewhat glibly, but so suppose I said to you, I have two alternatives and I would like for you to make a choice between them. And you say, oh, that sounds great. I'm taking a class on this very thing. So somebody says that to you and they're like, hey, what do you like more? Glub double or tata pata? So somebody says to you, hey, this is a very important person. Imagine they're in just, they're impeccably dressed. Okay, this is somebody from marketing, right? They're very cool as opposed to what you see in front of you. And they walk up to you with a straight face and they're probably taking notes and they say, hey you, and you're like, what's up? And they're like, hey, do you prefer glub double or tata pata? I am not proud of this, but I'm also kind of proud of it. And you're like, does that mean that you're not rational? No. It means that you don't have enough information for you to be able to make a comparison between two alternatives. You're not indifferent between glove double and tata pata. I can't wait to see what the closed captioning algorithms think I'm saying when I say glove double and tata pata. Take that, Google people. Glove double and tata pata. That's on the analysts. That's on the person in the suit. That's on whoever thought that these alternatives were something that you could reasonably compare. If you go to vote, voting day, um, there's a presidential election this year. They tell me. It's not like it's on the news or anything. There's a presidential election this year, and people might go to vote for president. And then... Maybe their state, you know, they, they're going to have to vote for representative, obviously. And then maybe they've got a senator up in their state. So, okay, they voted for president and representative and senator. And maybe there's like a county judge or a couple of referenda. And then, you know, we get down to the executive assistant associate dog catcher who is publicly elected in this county. For the record, I think that the executive assistant associate dog catcher has a very important job and that they should be treated with respect and dignity. Nevertheless, I suspect that when most people vote for executive assistant associate dog catcher, when they went in to vote for president, I don't think they're indifferent between the three alternatives from political parties they've never heard of. That's my guess. I think that they don't know. I think that's a violation of, of this rationality postulate of completeness. I think that I'm telling you a fable that doesn't have to work especially well when people are voting for executive assistant associate dog catcher. It might be a perfectly good model for voting for president. It probably isn't, but it's certainly better for president than it is for executive assistant associate dog catcher. So completeness is both kind of acceptable and also kind of not acceptable. What does it look like in the picture? Well, we have these three alternatives, A, B, and C, and right now we've met the reflexiveness criterion. And the reason that we've met the reflexive cr reflexiveness criterion is that all three of our dots have an arrow that start and end at the dot. However, this relation as we've drawn it so far is not complete because there exist pairs of alternatives for which there is no arrow, right? So completeness says there can't be a pair of dots that don't have an arrow between them. Okay, so let's fix that. Let's say that there's an arrow going from A to B and an arrow going from B to A and an arrow going from A to C and an arrow going from C to B. So four arrows I've drawn, A to B, B to A, A to C, and C to B. Hi, Chewy. This is now a complete relation. Why? Well, for every pair of dots, namely A, B, 
AC and BC, for every pair of dots, there's at least one arrow. In one case, there's two, and another case, there's only, in, in the other two cases, there's only one, but that's it. We're done. This is a complete relation, right? A is at least as good as B. B is at least as good as A. A is at least as good as C. And C is at least as good as B. So that's our second rationality postulate. So of the three, we assume that the, the decision maker has reflexive preferences, which is to say diet A and W is at least as good as diet A and W. That one is perfectly reasonable. There's this completeness requirement that every pair of alternatives must be comparable. And the decision maker must know enough about them to be able to at least be indifferent between them, right? So we're going to say that indifference and apathy are two different things. And that a rational decision maker is never worse than indifferent from an informational standpoint. Reflexiveness is not controversial. Completeness is a little bit annoying. You have to be smart. You have to make sure that you're choosing the right X for the decision maker in question. The third postulate is the really controversial one and it's called transitivity. And it is really the main rationality postulate. Whenever I say rationality, and I'm talking about the version of the fable about binary preference relations, I'm mostly talking about transitivity. In fact, it's possible to write down a rational choice theory that doesn't have any completeness in it. You can just do reflexive and transitive. You have no controversies because reflexiveness is just sort of baked in. Everything is at least as good as itself no completeness, and then just transitivity. And what you're saying at that point in time is, I'm just hanging my hat on transitivity. The problem is that it's a lot more difficult mathematically. And so completeness is only for convenience for us, but transitivity is where we're hanging our hat. Substantively, transitivity is definitely the straw stirring the drink. So what does it mean? Let me go back to symbols. So we say that a, a preference relation is transitive if, if, going to be an if then, right? If. The if is going to have two parts. It's going to be two parts linked with an and. If A is at least as good as B, and B is at least as good as C, so if those two things are true, this is the rationality promise, then I promise you, rationality promises you, if you knew that A was at least as good as B, and B was at least as good as C, then rationality promises that A is at least as good as C. What can't happen is it can't be the case that you like A at least as much as you like B, and B at least as much as you like C, and not like A at least as much as C. So you're not allowed to slip. You have to have some consistency there. Transitivity is really just a consistency requirement. Rationality is really about consistent choices. So in this example that we've drawn that is reflexive and complete, it's reasonable to wonder, is this all the way rational? Which is to say, is it reflexive, complete, and transitive? Well, it has to be the case that every time one alternative beats another alternative, and the second beats the third, then the first has to beat the third. So let's look at, let's, let's think about that. So for example, A is at least as good as C, and C is at least as good as B. Right? We have an arrow that goes from A to C, and we have an arrow that goes from C to B. Given that, it needs to be the case. It must be true. We need it to be true. In order for this check test to be passed, we need it to be true that A is at least as good as B. Well, do we have an arrow that goes from A to B? We do. So we, we pass that test. Does that mean that we're good? No, we need this to be true for every pair. Every time this chain happens on the left-hand side, we need, the, we need the, the proper pattern to kick in. For example, note also that we have B is at least as good as A, and A is at least as good as C. Yeah. Given that, we need it to be the case, we would need it to be true that B is at least as good as C. Do we have an arrow that starts at B and ends at C? We don't, so we fail. And in fact, this is not a transitive preference relation because of that. We needed it to be true that every time this happened, the third one happens too. In general, transitivity says there can't be any cycles. Well, then let's try and draw a, let's draw a transitive one. It's reflexive, so Every dot gets an arrow that goes to itself. And let's say that A is at least as good as B, 
B is at least as good as C. And A is at least as good as C. Now, there's only one possible chain. The only test that we would have to pass is A is at least as good as B, and B is at least as good as C. Is it also true that A is at least as good as C? Yes, we have an arrow that starts at A and ends at C. So it's transitive. It's complete because every pair of dots has at least one arrow. And it's reflexive because every dot has an arrow that starts and ends in itself. So this is our first example. We have just drawn a rational preference relation. It is reflexive, it is complete, and it is transitive. Uh, just to be explicit about it, suppose that we had the same example and that A was at least as good as B, B was at least as good as A, A was at least as good as C, C was at least as good as A, B was at least as good as C, and C was at least as good as B. In other words, this decision maker is what we're going to wind up calling indifferent about everything. You give them any pair of things and they're like, it's all the same to me. Okay, is this transitive? Yes. Um, how many different chains are there? Well, there's A to B, B to C. Do we have A to C? Yes. There's A to C, C to B. Do we have A to B? Yes. There's B to C, C to A. Do we have B to A? Yes. There's B to A, A to C. Do we have B to C? Yes. There's C to A, C to B. Do we have C to B? Yes. And there's C to B, C to A. Do we have C to A? Yes. So the total indifference relation is rational. Notice that in many situations, somebody would look at this and say, that doesn't seem very rational to me. So for example, if the three alternatives are you win an election, you lose an election, and you tie. And we're saying that somebody that ran for office is, you know, maybe this is their preference relation on that. Winning is at least as good as losing, is at least as good as tying, and they're all the same. Does that seem rational to you? No. But it's reflexive, complete, and transitive, which is our definition of rationality in this version of the fable. In other words, rational doesn't have to be reasonable. Rational just has to be consistent. So we've defined rationality by using this weak preference relation, this idea that we can encode what it means for an alternative to be at least as good as another alternative. But there are times where you want to say something stronger than at least as good. So sometimes you don't like one alternative at least as much as you like another alternative, right? You like one alternative strictly more. So this is Diet A and W, the nectar of the gods. And this is Pomplamoose LaCroix, which is something. I like this strictly more than I like this. I don't like it as much as, I mean, that's true, but I, it's, I like, there's something bigger than that. I like this more. I like this strictly more than this. We haven't said that. All we have so far is at least as good as. I want something stronger. So we're going to define two new relations using this foundational relation that we've defined. So. Both of these are just going to be if and only if sort of definitions. So I'm going to write A is strictly better than B. So this means that alternative A is strictly better than alternative B. And look, it's just a squiggly, than, squiggly strictly greater than sign, right? So I'm going to say that A is strictly better than B if two things hold. Okay, if and only if two things are true. One, A is at least as good as B. So in order for me to strictly like one alternative more than the other, I have to weakly like it more than the other. So in order for me to say I strictly like root beer more than pomplamoose, I have to be able to also say I like root beer at least as much as pomplamoose. Seriously, of all the things to be in the fridge, it's got to be pomplamoose. And I need it to not be the case that B is at least as good as A. So I can either write that by negating B as at least as good as A, or I can put a slash through that. I can also have B is not with that slash through the greater than or equal to sign A. These are just two ways of writing the same thing. And so substantively what we're saying is, if I like this strictly more than I like this, what that means is, I like this at least as much as I like this, and it's not the case that I like this at least as much as I like this. So strict preference is weak preference that isn't reciprocated. And we also have an indifference relation. So if I write A, sort of this squiggly sign, it looks like a tilde, B, well that means 
I'll write that if and only if A is at least as good as B and B is at least as good as A. I'm indifferent between A and B, if and only if. I like A at least as much as I like B and I like B at least as much as I like A. So precisely when there's a two-way arrow, right? If there's a two-way arrow, read that as indifference. If it's a one-way arrow, read that as strict preference. So that's what I meant when I said that you have to at least be indifferent between two alternatives, right? So I said from completeness that one of three things must be true. A is at least as good as B, B is at least as good as A, or both. Well, in case one where it's just A is at least as good as B and not both, then that means that A is strictly better than B. In case two, same logic, B is strictly better than A. In case three, where they're both true, indifference. I kind of feel like after all this bad mouthing, I need to actually, let's do it. Let's be bold. PS231 is all about being bold. Did I just splash myself with pop balloons? I did. Being bold sucks. Down the hatch. All right, so what's happened so far? We introduced this primitive notion of a binary relation between sets of alternatives. So we have a set of alternatives and we have this binary weak preference is at least as good as relation. And we've said that rationality boils down to having a weak preference relation that is reflexive, complete, and transitive. Great. We've now defined two other seemingly relevant substantive notions, strict preference and indifference, that are just the, the children of weak preference, right? We've defined them solely in terms of weak preference. Now, one thing that's remarkable is that then we have to accept whatever happens from strict preference and indifference if we accept the rationality assumptions of, of reflexiveness, completeness, and transitivity of weak preference, then we also have to, whatever we learn about strict preference and indifference using those properties also has to be true. So in your problem set, you're going to show, I know you're really excited, you're going to show that A is indifferent to B, the indifference relation is also transitive. What do I mean by that? I mean that if A is indifferent to B, and B is indifferent to C, right? So if A is indifferent to B, and B is indifferent to C, it must also be the case that A is indifferent to C, okay? That is an implication. You're gonna prove that. You're gonna show that that must be true as a consequence of the reflexiveness, completeness, and transitivity of weak preferences. The assumptions that we made of rationality aren't just problematic about weak preferences. We also have to think about their downstream ramifications because we defined indifference in terms of weak preference. So. I'm going to introduce a very famous counterexample to this transitivity. I'll be right back. In the name of science and good teaching, I am now going to live out the cup of coffee problem, which is to say a philosophical representation of the problematicness of the transitivity of the indifference relation. And you're like, what the hell is he talking about? All right. I have a perfectly good Pomplemousse LaCroix. It's perfectly good. I also have a salt well. So, we're gonna have many versions of this. We're gonna have many, many versions of this. Of this Pomplemousse LaCroix. So let's say that P0 is the alternative where Pomplemousse LaCroix has no grains of salt in it. 
I'm now going to make a new Pomplemousse LaCroix by taking one grain of salt and dropping it in. You can hear the ocean. That's how you know it's made with real Pomplemousse. So now I have P1, which is a Pomplemousse LaCroix with one grain of salt in it. And I will write P1. And I taste it. I can't tell the difference. I can't detect the salt. So I'm going to put indifferent. I'm indifferent between P0 and P1, which taste the same to me. Okay. I take P1. I add another grain of salt. Call this P2. Well. Oh, it tastes the same. I don't taste any. So I'm indifferent between P1 and P2. Still can't taste it. Still tastes like real pomplemousse. So I'm indifferent between P2 and P3. Down the hatch. Can't tell. I'm indifferent between P3 and P4. P5 tastes about the same to me as P4, but I'm starting to tell some salt. Proust. Nope, I'm, I'm in, so I'm indifferent between P5 and P6. Salute. I'm indifferent between P6 and P7. Slauncher! I'm indifferent between P7 and P8. It's getting saltier, but I can't tell the difference. But just like 7 and 8 taste the same. They both taste salty, but they taste the same to me. Gone by! I'm indifferent between P8 and P9. Chuck D. Oh, that's some salty pomplemousse goodness. I'm indifferent between P9 and P10. <laughs> Yamas. I'm indifferent between P10 and P11. Nadrosvie! I'm indifferent between P11 and P12. Whoever wrote this is evil, and I don't like that he did it to me. Saudi! Mm. I'm indifferent between P12 and P13. Now. I've got this super salty P13. This is P13. I've added a lot of salt to P13. And here's P0. This is my salty one, and this one has not been opened. This is P0 again. Am I indifferent between these two cans? Well, it tastes pomplemousy, but not particularly salty. I'm going to be sick. Now, according to transitivity of indifference, I have to be indifferent between these two things. Why? I was indifferent between nothing and one grain. 
one grain and two grains, two grains and three grains, and so on, well, that makes a chain of transitivity, right? And so I must be indifferent between zero grains and way too many grains. So my sensory limitation is the problem there. It isn't that I'm not rational. It's that there's the implication of indifference is that your sensory limitations between the alternatives, uh, if you have limitations that induce indifference, that doesn't mean that that's going to be something that you should be able to reliably infer about your preferences as you add more and more salt to your pomplemousse, LaCroix. That's not a sentence I was planning on saying today. I'm going to put this one in the garbage and I'm going to keep drinking this one. But any, if you see more grimacing, it's because of the all-natural pomple moosiness and not the salt. You should listen to the pomple moose band. They're really good. There are some other interesting properties that emerge right off the bat. Again, you'll be showing this on your problem set. Um, one is that strict preference has something referred to as asymmetry, right? So. Um, if I like one alternative strictly more than the other, so if A is strictly better than B, right, then that implies that it can't be the case that B is strictly better than A. That makes sense. That one, I don't have to torture myself with salt. So that's our first fable. The, the rationality fable of binary preference relations assumes, the story goes, that there's a set of alternatives and a decision maker, and the decision maker chooses from the set of alternatives that they like at least as much as all the others. So let me be a little bit more precise about that. So the idea here, we haven't talked about what they're actually gonna choose. Right now, these are all hypotheticals other than the fact that I have lots of salt in my esophagus as we speak. These are all hypothetical decisions. We haven't observed anything, right? We don't know what they choose. We don't know what seems the most reasonable thing to be chosen. All we know is that deep inside of our decision maker's brain lives some part of the brain called the squiggly preference relation part of the brain that assigns for every pair of alternatives a strictly greater than or an indifference. But what would you choose then? Consider the following set. I'm gonna call this, we're gonna call this the set of maximal elements. The set of maximal elements with respect to the ordering that the decision maker has deep inside of them. So I'm gonna say the set of all X in X, so the set of alternatives, Right? This is going to be in set, set building notation. So the set of all alternatives, little x and x, such that x is at least as good as y for all y and x. So in other words, we want to choose from this top set of alternatives. So something lives in this set, this, this maximal set. x lives in that set only if it's at least as good as everything else. So consider, for example, the very simple one, two, three, A, B, C. It's reflexive, so we're gonna draw dots between every dot and itself, draw arrows between every dot and itself. And let's say A is at least as good as B, B is at least as good as C, and then transitivity gives us A is at least as good as C. And let's also have, just for fun, that B is at least as good as A. So. Is it reflexive? Yes, every dot has an arrow that goes from itself to itself. Is it complete? Yes, every pair of alternatives has at least one arrow, and in fact, one pair has two arrows. Is it transitive? Well, we have A is at least as good as B, B is at least as good as C, we need A is at least as good as C, we have it. We have B is at least as good as A, and A is at least as good as C, we need B is at least as good as C, we have it. So this is a complete, reflexive, transitive relation. This is a rational person with these three alternatives. So what should they choose, right? Well, here, the set of maximal elements is A and B. It's a subset of the set of alternatives. So we hone in on A and B, and why do we do that? Well, consider alternative A, the A and W. God, I miss those days. Well. A is at least as good as B, and A is also at least as good as C. So there's nothing that A isn't at least as good as. A is at least as good as everything else. Likewise, B is at least as good as A, and is at least as good as C. So it's at least as good as everything else too. So that's what this maximal set is. It's the set of all alternatives that are at least as good as every other alternative. That seems like a reasonable thing that somebody might choose from, right? I mean, 
if if we thought that this process was going on in somebody's brain where they're making all these binary comparisons, apparently this is the hand gesture, binary comparisons. So they're making all these binary comparisons. There's no way that I shouldn't use judo charms. Well, if they were doing that, and then they, they came to you for advice, and they were like, well, I, f I really feel like I've sorted the world out. And you're like, what do you mean by that? And they're like, I have a preference relation that lives inside of me that is reflexive, complete, and transitive. And you're like, sounds good to me. That checks out. Well, then they said to you, but I don't know what to choose. All I have are all these evaluative statements. Isn't the first thing that you'd say, find the thing that's best or is at least as good as everything else? Yes. So this is, this is the set that we care about. Well, here's a nice property. If the relation in question is reflexive, complete, and transitive, which is to say if we have a rational decision maker, then this set of alternatives will never be empty. If then. If rational, then there's always at least one alternative to pick. It might be two, it might be three. You might have to choose from among your favorite things. You know, maybe you've got raindrops on roses here and you've got whiskers on kittens there. You'd have to pick one in any given context, but at least you have to choose from one of those. If, if you have raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens and toxic sludge served to you in a pomplamoose can, you should choose raindrops on roses or whiskers on kittens. Don't choose toxic sludge, no matter how good the can looks. So that's our first fable. Our first fable is that the decision maker has this, this set of binary comparisons that lives inside of them. The, the weak version of the comparison is reflexive, complete, and transitive, which has ramifications, um, and that they choose from among the top set, the, the maximal set, um, that's at least as good as everything else, and the rationality postulates deliver a non-empty set of alternatives to choose from. That's fable one. Now, nobody does this. Nobody does this. But it's still a pretty useful fable, right? Because it, this puts the focus on the, on, the, on the comparing. This is sometimes the version of the story where people are like, this is not how people make comparisons because they don't think about every pair of alternatives. And that's true, they don't. But it's useful to just wonder what it would look like if they did. Now we'll be able to compare other, maybe more realistic processes to this. So in the B block, we're gonna talk about probably the most laughable version of the rationalist fable, utility maximization and we'll show how it relates to completeness and transitivity and reflexiveness of a binary preference relation. So let's go to the B block. So if you've read any rationalist papers, if you've read any papers with game theory in them or anything like that in your other classes, you probably didn't see any squiggly greater than or equal to signs, right? And in fact, political scientists typically don't worry about this too much. Um, this is much more of a microeconomic concept, but I think it's super important for other reasons. You don't see this. You don't, you don't see that, that version of the fable very often, right? Instead, you see the version of the fable that goes like the following. Well, suppose that the decision maker faces that same set of alternatives, X. They have a finite set of alternatives to choose from. A and W, Pomplemousse, Salty Pomplemousse, and Premier Protein, which is what I should have had in the first place. This Pomplemousse, all it's done is give me heartache and heartburn. So they have this set of alternatives. They're very tired. They don't want to make comparisons. They don't want to have to make every binary comparison that's possible. And if you think about it, one thing that's tricky, one reason to think it's implausible that people actually engage in all this binary comparisons is thinking about how many they would have to make as a function of how big the set of alternatives is, right? So for example, let's say that we just had two alternatives, A and B. Well, with two alternatives, A and B, there's only one pair to compare, and you can think about it two ways, right? So is A at least as good as B? Is B at least as good as A? I'm just going to skip over the fact that we also need to check A against A and B against B. Right now, let's just worry about the non-reflexive things, okay? So with two alternatives, there are two possible arrows to check, right? With three alternatives, there's... I should actually label these so I don't say stupid things. Oh, that's what's going to stop me from saying stupid things. There's A to B, B to A, A to C, C to A, 
B to C, C to A. So now there's six possible arrows. Let's say there's four alternatives, A, B, C, D. Well, there's A to B, B to A, B to D, D to B, C to D, D to C, A to C, C to A, B to C, C to B, A to D, D to A. So that's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. In general, it's going to be N times N minus one possible alternative, possible arrows, right? So with two alternatives, it's two times one is two. With three alternatives, it's three times two is six. With four alternatives, it's four times three is 12. Well, let's think about, let's say there were 10 alternatives. So you go to a mini mart and there's 10 different drinks. That's plausible, that happens, right? All right, well then you need 10 times nine is 90 comparisons. Do you actually think that you have stored 90 comparisons in your brain? among all the different delicious options and pomplamoose at your local mini mart? No, and that's just with 10. You chose a major. How many different majors are there at the U of I? Well, that's a good question. They don't tell you? Well, then let me show you. There's this many majors. There's this many majors. You chose one or two or three or whatever. There were a hundred majors maybe. That means you need to have 9,900 comparisons. So the idea of utility maximization is that you don't want to have to put up with all the n times n minus one comparisons that you have to make on the set of alternatives, x. A decision maker sees the set of alternatives, x, and if they had to make a binary comparison between every pair of alternatives, they'd get overwhelmed very quickly, right? So let's say, is there an easier way? Is there an easier fable? Right? None of these, what we do with our brains is amazing. It's silly to think that we were gonna be able to get it all perfectly with a super simple story like this, but that's our job. So I have this finite set of alternatives, X, and I don't wanna to have to make all those binary comparisons. What would be a tool that I could use that would allow me to do that? Well, that's what a utility function is. And so a utility function is just a function U colon, and it reads in X and it spits out real numbers. Remember, a function, when I write u colon x arrow r, oh, that pomplamoose is killing me. That set of symbols means u is a function, and it reads in elements from x. It reads in alternatives. The domain is the set of alternatives. So it reads in an alternative, and it spits out something from the codomain, a real number, right? So it, it reads in a drink, and it spits out a happiness number. And the idea is that the number tells you uh, what, what rank would you assign to that alternative? Or something like that, where, where higher numbers mean higher ranked alternatives. Just to give an example, suppose that we had a set of alternatives that was, um, let's say that you were ranking your favorite political parties, okay? And let's say that there's a red team and a blue team and a green team. There should be four pair parties. Let's have four parties. So we've got the reds, the blues, the greens, and the purples. Maybe they're the moderates. So we've got this set of four parties and your job is to choose an alternative. Your, your job is to, to pick a party to vote for or something like that. Well, because there's four, it was like A, B, C, D, there are 12 different binary comparisons you'd have to make. That's annoying. What if instead you took your favorite party and you gave it a, a number, let's say you gave it a four, right? So let's say that your favorite party was the greens. So you'll take green and say that you of green equals four. So it's a function, just like f of x, but now it's u of green. So you're gonna say your utility from the green party being in office is a four. And maybe your second favorite team is the purple party. So then u of purple, maybe that's a three. Don't choose weird numbers here. Let's keep things simple. Then maybe your third favorite party are the reds. So, so u of red, equals two, and then u of blue equals one. So now instead of 12 comparisons, you've got four numbers. And the idea is that the utility function simplifies all those comparisons. It's annoying to say to yourself, well, I gotta make all these binary choices. When I choose something, I just wanna choose something that feels good relative to all the others, right? So what would that look like in terms of the pictures? So I've got these four dots and they're red, blue, green, 
purple. And everybody likes their the, a party as much as itself, so red to red, blue to blue, purple to purple, green to green. The idea here is, and, and we'll formalize this momentarily, but the basic idea here is that utilities, if one alternative has a bigger utility than the other in terms of the number, then that means that it is preferred. And if it has the same utility, then that means that it's indifferent. So for example, four, green has a four, that's the highest utility of these numbers. So that means because four is greater than three, right? That means that there's an arrow between green and the next best alternative, purple. Four is bigger than two, so there's an arrow between green and the third favorite alternative, red. Four is bigger than one, and so there's an arrow between green and blue. Well, purple, it has a three, so it doesn't get an arrow to green, but it is, does get to have an arrow. There's an arrow from purple to red because three is bigger than two, and there's an arrow from purple to blue because three is bigger than one. Well, red gets to have an arrow too because it goes from, there should be an arrow between red and blue because red has a two and blue has a one. So we just took this really complicated picture and we drew it from the utility numbers. But an interesting question is, well, the, is the pictures that we drew, does it represent a relation that is complete, reflexive, and transitive? Well, yeah. In other words, this utility number that we assigned that kind of represented what we were saying linguistically might be some preferences, encoded a perfectly good rational preference relation. So the big question here is, is it possible to, given a preference relation, is it possible to come up with a number, a function, a numeric function, a utility function that reads in alternatives and spits out happiness numbers like 4, 3, 2, 1? Is it possible to come up with such a function that represents that relation? And the answer is yes, assuming that it's a rational relation. Let me give you a formal definition of what it means for a utility function to represent a binary preference relation. We say that a utility function u that reads in x's and spits out r's, so, so u which goes from the set of alternatives x to the set of real numbers r, so it just spits out a number. We say that that function represents a binary preference relation on that same set x. Right? So we have the same set of alternatives. It works binary, it works utility. So we say that that utility function represents that binary preference relation. X is at least as good as Y. So in other words, per the preference relation, X is at least as good as Y. If and only if U of X is greater than or equal to, those are numbers that I'm compar comparing there, U of Y. So in other words, the utility function represents the binary preference relation if and only if better alternatives get higher numbers. That means that it, the utility function encapsulates all of the ordinal information that the binary preference relation gives you. So it takes this big web of arrows, right? And it takes all those arrows and it summarizes it in a very simple way with just by just assigning every alternative a number. If one alternative has a strictly larger number than another alternative, then it is strictly preferred. And if they have the same number, then that means that there's an indifference going on. So that's what it means to represent. And we say a preference relation is representable if there exists a function that represents it. So this representability is basically our way of saying this utility function, if it represents the binary preference relation, then it carries with it all of the same information. It carries the same rankings. It just gives them numbers instead of showing up in a pattern of arrows. Notice that the intensity of the utility numbers here doesn't matter. So, so going back to our previous example with four, three, two, one, Let's say that you gave your favorite party a million instead of a four. You really like that party. That, that has nothing to do with representability. Representability is only about the ordinal ranking, the intensity of the number, the, the, the actual, how big the scale is, that doesn't matter. We're only thinking about ordinal preferences right now. We're only thinking about the rankings. 
So if you like Coke more than Pepsi, and you like Pepsi more than Toxic Sludge, the more than thing that I'm saying conveys the same amount of information. There is no intensity of preference happening here. The only way that you would show, and it isn't drum tight, but what would be suggestive of intense preferences is if lots of alternatives came in between. So I don't have something that says I like Pepsi much more than I like Toxic Sludge, but I like Pepsi more than I like, well, not too many things. I like Pepsi more than I like Mellow Yellow. I like Mellow Yellow more than I like RC Cola. I like RC Cola more than I like blah, blah, blah. I don't like Toxic Sludge. So all this utility function is doing is, is spitting out ordinal rankings. So if a preference relation is representable, which is to say if there's a utility function that carries its ordinal rankings, then that means that we don't have to worry about all of those webs of arrows. We don't have to think the decision maker is actually making all those binary comparisons. They're just choosing the alternatives that give them the highest utility numbers. They're maximizing their utility. They are utility maximizers. So then you might be wondering, well, which preference relations are representable? So not all preference relations are representable. So just to give you an example, let's say I've got A, B, and C, and suppose that I had an arrow from A to B, an arrow from B to C, and an arrow from C to A. Well, I'll give, so A beats B, so I'll give A a three and B a two. And B beats C, and I need C to be something less than two, so let's call that a one. But then C beats A, but one isn't more than three. I can't come up with a function that represents this thing. There is no number that gives C the same number every time. And that's what a function is. It takes a C and it spits out a number. Not two numbers, one number. So there's no way to, to represent this. You'll note also that it, also, it isn't transitive. So what kind of preference relations are representable? Which kind of preference relations can we have utility representations of? Okay. Here's your first theorem. What's a theorem? A theorem is a statement that is always true. It's a valid statement, which is to say in the truth table, it's all T's. So this is a straight up tautology. This is what we're looking for. This is the, these are the moments of awesomeness. I mean, there's a lot of moments of awesomeness. We've got a whiteboard of awesomeness. We've got a bookshelf of awesomeness. We've got a dog of awesomeness. We don't have a professor of awesomeness and we don't have a drink of awesomeness, but there's still a lot of awesomeness. That salt is starting to go to my head. So here's your first theorem. This is a true statement. I'm not gonna to prove to you why it's true, although it's not that hard, but it just isn't, it isn't worth it. We can talk about it in class if you're interested, although you know maybe wait until Wednesday. So first I'm gonna issue a scope condition. It's gonna be the something that, uh, it's gonna be something I slid in quickly earlier. Let X be a finite set of alternatives. So I've got, one list with a, a, a particular number of alternatives for political parties. Start a war on the Western Front, start a war on the Eastern Front, or both. Pompamoose versus Root Beer. Does a, does a party in a war, do they back down after they've issued a threat? Some, some finite set, discrete. So I've got a discrete set of alternatives. A preference relation, call it this squiggly thing, on X, so it's a, it's a set of rankings, it's a set of preference rankings on X, right? this is what we've been talking about, is representable, which is to say we can make life easy and do a utility maximization version of the story instead of a binary preference relation story. Here comes a big part. If and only if, if and only if, it goes both ways, the preference relation is rational, which is to say it's reflexive, complete, and transitive. So in other words, if we have a ranking that is reflexive, complete, and transitive, then there's a utility representation of it. And if you have a utility representation, if you start a paper that just has utility functions in it, then you could just as easily have started with one that had all those comparisons in it. So in other words, when somebody writes down a paper that just has a utility function in it, because that's simple and easy and that's what we do, and there's a finite set of alternatives, implicitly, they're saying, Imagine that somebody had all these binary comparisons in them and then chose the thing that was at least as good as everything else. That's the same thing as maximizing utility. So rationality is great for lots of reasons, but a rational preference relation, a 
reflexive complete and transitive preference relation is great because it is fully equivalent with a preference relation that can be represented by a utility function. It's the same thing. Utility functions mean that there's some rational reflexive complete and transitive relation living deep underneath the decision maker who all we observe about them, all that we saw were those four numbers. All that we saw was the four, three, two, one. And we are allowed to back out the fact that there was a rational preference relation with all those arrows baked in. We can, we can, we can, we can work backwards. So we can go from arrows to utilities or from utilities to arrows. That's what if and only if means. So this is the most standard version of the story. The most standard version of the story is that um, there's a set of alternatives or outcomes and that set of alternatives or outcomes, uh, the decision maker finds the thing that gives them the highest utility. And that's the same thing as finding a thing that's at least as good as everything else. Now, does that mean that everybody has a utility part of their brain? No. No. I mean, it's plausible, but to the best of my knowledge, that hasn't really happened. But at the very least, it provides you with some substantive justifications for the use of a utility function. When you see a utility function, it's tempting to say, ah, oh, yeah, nobody has a utility function in their head, and that's true. But at the very least, it's plausible to imagine asking somebody how they felt between every pair of alternatives, looking at their rankings, checking to see if there was reflexiveness, completeness, and transitivity, and then building a utility function based on their arrows. That's totally allowable, right? So even if they don't have utility functions, they might behave as if they have them. So that's the second version of the fable. The second version of the fable is... Uh, the decision maker observes a finite set of alternatives, assigns each of them a number, and then chooses either the one that gives the highest number or chooses from among the ones that give the highest number. And we just found out that rational preferences are equivalent to utility maximization, right? If you have rational preferences and choose from the set of alternatives that you like at least as much as everything else, that's the same exact process, equivalent process, to choosing the alternative that maximizes your utility function. Which is great because that is a wonderful shorthand. We can, instead of having to think about 12 different arrows, we can just assign four different numbers. Instead of thinking about 90 different, if it was 10 against 9 is 90, I could just give 10 alternatives a number and have 10, right? So my informational gains from the utility function are increasing in the size of x. With only two alternatives, if you knew the utility numbers, then you would know exactly everything that would be known about the arrows and vice versa. But as you go further and further and further, if you have 100 alternatives, you would have to have 9,900 different arrows instead of just 100 different utility numbers. That's, a, that's cool. That's cool. It's worth noting that a lot of early thinkers in this tradition, at least in the 1800s, were of the opinion that utility actually existed. Um, and that there was some concept of utility that people experienced. That has since been, I don't know if it's been debunked, but it certainly isn't the current set of beliefs on the subject. But so we, in these two versions of the myth, we still haven't found anything verifiable. So if we were an analyst, stop. if I was an analyst, stop using the royal we, if I was an analyst and I was interested in understanding how a decision maker thought, I want to learn everything there is to know about this decision maker. I could ask them to assign utility numbers to something and then back it out if I, if, I, if I wanted to, but I don't really think that there's a part of their brain that's like the utility part of the brain. And I could ask them to make binary comparisons, or I could ask them to make binary comparisons between all the alternatives, but that doesn't mean that that's actually what they're doing out in the wild when they're making choices. We haven't said anything about choice, really, other than the fact that we suspect the decision maker will choose from the set of top ranked alternatives, the set of maximal elements, or that they'll choose the things that give them the, they'll choose the things that maximize their utility function. But that's the guess. We don't observe preferences and we don't observe utility. And asking people something oftentimes is an imperfect way to learn about the thing that we want to observe. People don't always know what their preferences are. People don't always know what their utilities are, or they might have an incentive to misrepresent them. So how can we build a fable that has some of the similar flavor, but has also the property that it's observable? 
right? If there was a part of your brain, if I could de develop a machine that if I saw it, I would know what you would choose. Maybe I would call that preferences, but it isn't obvious why that would be preferences necessarily, a priori. So let's just skip all this and let's just look at the choices, right? Because that's what we're going to do in the C block. So the idea with the third version of the fable is that the first two versions of the fable, while delightfully charming and completely reasonable from a modeling standpoint, if you wanted to just say, you know, I'm writing fable people and I'm starting with fable people like this, these are great. But if you then wanted to see whether or not the people in your fables behaved like people out in the real world, you aren't equipped to do it. So it's interesting to wonder what observable things about the real world, what what can we learn about choices that get made and then use that to back out some of these fables that we've written called preferences and utility? So we need a model of rational choice, not of rational preferences and not of rational utility. So what would that look like? Well, the third version of the fable has the same once upon a time. It has a finite set of alternatives, X. But the substantive idea here is that they're going to be different contexts. So suppose that you're an experimenter and you have a set of alternatives that you need to learn about and you have a decision maker you want to learn about how they feel about those alternatives. Well one nice thing about experiments is you get to repeat them. So the idea here is that we have a set of alternatives but that we can we can repeat trials and so a trial is going to be some set, some subset of the alternatives where you present the decision maker not with all the alternatives at once but instead you show them some small menu Right? So I'm going to have a set of menus, M, okay? And the idea of M is it's the set of all subsets of X. So we know what a subset is. A subset of a given set is something where everything that's in the subset is also in the big set. So when I say a menu, I mean something that is some of the alternatives, maybe all of the alternatives, maybe one of the alternatives. It's not a very interesting choice. All right, so for example, let's say that I've got two alternatives, A and B. So M is going to be the set of all non-empty subsets of X. And I'm only saying that because technically speaking, the, subset, the, the empty set is a subset of every set, but I don't want to make people choose between nothing. So we always, we'll always give them at least one alternative to choose from, and one is boring too, right? Okay, so if I've got A and B, the set of all non-empty subsets, well, there's three of those, right? There's just the set A, there's just the set B, and there's just the set AB. And you're like, can a set, can the elements of a set be sets? Yeah. So here's my set of possible menus. Choose from A, choose from B, or choose from AB. That's a real choice. So this is the set of all non-empty subsets. That's my set of menus. Okay. Well, let's complicate things slightly. Not complicate, but just have three instead. A, B, and C. So what are all the menus? Well, there's just A, there's just B, there's just C. We're not going to worry too much about these. Uh, so a set with one element is called a singleton. We're not going to worry too much about the singletons. Okay? Okay. So I'm not going to worry too much about these singleton subsets. Here's some more interesting ones. Choose between A and B. Choose between A and C. Choose between B and C. Right? So these are all subsets that have two elements. And then finally, choose from between A, B, and C. So that's my set of all menus. If I have three alternatives, then my set of possible menus is every subset, all the subsets with one, all the subsets with two, and all the subsets with all three. In general, so the, the set of all subsets of a set is called the power set of a set. Um, and what's interesting is for finite sets like this, um, a finite set with n elements in it will have two to the n subsets, including the empty set. And so it will always be two to the n 
minus one in the set of menus. Technically speaking, you're allowed to have a sparser set of menus than this. Like, like if you had a hundred alternatives that you were trying to compare, that would mean that you would need two to the 100 menus. Um, the NSF probably isn't gonna fund that project. Can't really say that I would either, right? So, um, but for this class, it's just easier to think about all possible menus. This is what's called a saturated set of menus. Don't worry about that too much. But if you're interested, you might be able to, you can weaken the, the, the set of menus thing. Okay, so we've got X, a set of alternatives, and we've got M, a set of menus. And the idea is that M, every element of M is like a trial, right? We, we asked the research team, hey, we asked people to compare A and B, what did they pick? Well, we need, a, we need something that tells us what they picked, right? So I'm gonna also introduce C. And C is, C is a mapping. It's not really a function, it's a mapping. Because it's allowed to pick out subsets. So C is gonna read in menus and it's gonna spit out subsets of the menu. So in other words, the rule is that C of some menu, little m, has to be a subset of little m, and C of m can't be the empty set. So for example, suppose that we had a menu that was x, y, z. So we've got a three element menu. And then I said, well, what's the choice gonna be? What's the, you, if I show you x, y, and z, what would you choose? Well, the idea here is that you're allowed to choose multiple elements. You're, gonna, you're Basically what you're saying is if I don't choose something, then I'm ruling it out. So for example, suppose that C of x, y, z was x, y. So it reads in x, y, z, and it spits out some subset of that. And here we're saying, well, if you let me choose between A and W, Premier Protein and Pomplemousse, you know, I don't feel like choosing between the A and W and the Premier Protein right now, but I can tell you right now, I don't want the Pomplemousse. So here we're saying C of X, Y, Z is X, Y, which is his way of saying, just rule out the Z. So this choice, we don't need to know why. We don't need to know what the underlying thing is that made you choose X and Y out of X, Y, Z. We don't need to know the mechanism. We don't need to know the part of your brain that was firing. We can observe that. You walk into a mini mart and you choose a Monster Energy drink. Is that, do they still make that? I observed you choose. I didn't have to ask you any questions. I don't have to say why. I don't have to say what was your utility. I, didn't, I don't have to say, hey, how do you compare that against other things? Maybe they just went in there and chose randomly. They don't need to have a utility to make their choices. They don't have to have a preference relation to make their choices. I don't give a crap. All I need to see is their choices. This is a mod, this fable is only about choices, right? So this has no why in it at all. There is no explanation happening. It's just a matter of observing the choices. You give them one menu and they choose some set of elements from that menu. You give them another menu and they choose some set of men elements from that other menu and so on. You just keep giving them menus and you keep seeing what they do. So in other words, a person can go into this completely irrational, just choosing things at random. Now it's time for us to impose some consistency requirement, okay? So an interesting question is, what does rational behavior look like with these choices? Okay, well, here's the usual criterion. So it's called the weak axiom of revealed preference. The idea here is that your choices reveal your preferences, not the other way around. Um, so the weak axiom of revealed preference, there's a couple different flavors of it. Chewie doesn't like it. Chewie's much more of a preferences guy. Anyway, so the we're, I'm just going to call this warp, W-A-R-P, warp, for the weak axiom of revealed preference. This was developed by Paul Samuelson, I think in the 1940s. And so the idea here was that we were starting to be able to compile reliable data on people's choices, and we wanted to know if that told us anything about their preferences. So we say, we say a choice function, now we're saying a choice function satisfies warp. 
So we say that a choice function satisfies the weak axiom of revealed preference or warp if any time there's a menu. So if there exists a menu, call it little m and big M. Okay. So if there exists a menu, little m and big M, such that x is an element of what got chosen from that little menu and y was an element of m. So if there's a world, if there's a menu, if there's a choice context where x and y were among the things on your menu in that context, and x is one of the things that you chose, it doesn't have to be the only thing that you chose. It only has to be one of the things that you chose. So if there exists some menu where you chose x out of something that included y as well, okay, so if this is true, if this is true about you, then it must also be true. Consistency. See, we're saying if you do one thing, then you have to do something else. This is what I mean by consistent behavior. That's transitivity in a preference relation, right? Here I'm saying if, if this was something that you chose, then it cannot be the case that there's some other menu, call it M prime. There cannot exist some menu M prime with the following properties. X and Y are both elements of M prime. So in other words, it can't be the case that those same two things that we just learned about in menu M, they're both in M prime. So it can't be the case that that's the menu, that Y got chosen, Y is an element of C of M prime. So on that menu, Y got chosen and X didn't. X is not an element of C of M prime. So in other words, if in menu M, you revealed that X was at least as good as Y, right? Because X and Y were both on the menu and X is one of the things that got chosen. It might be the only thing, but at least it's one of the things that got chosen, okay? So you revealed, when you chose from menu M, you revealed that you liked X at least as much as Y. Then, it can't be the case that I show you another menu that has X and Y on it, and you choose Y but not X. So for example, Suppose my set of alternatives is a Coke, a Pepsi, and a Sprite. And in the menu with just Coke and Pepsi, I choose Coke. And then in the menu with Coke, Pepsi, and Sprite, I choose Pepsi and Sprite. Well, how come you picked Pepsi when there was all three, but you didn't when there was just the two? What's with that? So this is a consistency of choice criterion. This is a way of saying if if X was good enough to be worthy of a semi-vote when it was just X and Y, then it can't be the case that Y definitively beats X some other time that you could choose between them. Put slightly differently, if you reveal in menu M that X is revealed to be weakly as good as Y, then it cannot be the case that in some other menu, Y is revealed to be strictly better than X. So that's warp, the weak axiom of revealed preference. Well, guess what? Here's another theorem. It's going to be in two parts. It's basically an if and only if. I just you have to say it slightly differently. So for the theorem, let X be a finite set of alternatives and let M be a saturated set of menus, a set of all possible subsets of X, all non-empty subsets of X. We have a finite set of alternatives and we have every menu that we could want about it. And the theorem is going to be in two parts. One, if a choice function on M satisfies the weak axiom of revealed preference, then you could use it to generate a rational preference relation where X is at least as good as Y if and only if X is chosen when X and Y are both in a menu. So in other words, you can take a warp satisfying choice function and use it to define a rational preference relation. And any rational preference relation can be used to microfound choices that satisfy warp. So in other words, if you choose from the set of alternatives, that's a, if you choose from the set of maximal elements, the set of things they're at least as good as from a preference relation, then you could use that to make a choice function that satisfied warp. So in other words, with a finite x, you can 
turn a warp satisfying choice function into a rational preference relation, or you could turn, turn a rational preference relation into a warp satisfying choice function. Either way, rationality of preferences implies rationality of choices, and rationality of choices implies rationality of preferences. They're equivalent too. And because, because utility maximization was equivalent to preferences, it's equivalent to warp satisfaction too. So in other words, the three fables are all the same. All three of these fables are the same, and it gives you three distinct angles to look at the same thing. In one, it's just simple utility maximization, where I don't want to get too involved with all of this detail, and I just say, every alternative gets a number. That's what the average working political scientist is interested in. That's what the average anybody is interested in. Most people aren't saying to themselves, well, I don't know why these choices got made. We just want to know what the choices are, right? So utility maximization, which is the standard way to, to model people, is equivalent to both preference relations, so you can get out all of this nuanced information in terms of how each alternative is ranked against the others, and it's also equivalent to something understandable and verifiable on the empirical end through choice functions. That's great. That's amazing, right? So... So we have three different angles at the same thing, all of which are just about consistency of choices. Rationality is entirely about consistency and not at all about reasonableness. Suppose that there are three possible situations. One where you get $1, great. One where you get $2, great. And one where you get $100, great. But suppose that you had the following preferences. You preferred one dollar to two dollars one was at least as good as two one was at least as good as a hundred and one hundred was at least as good as two so in other words you've got three alternatives one two and one hundred one is at least as good as two one is at least as good as a hundred and a hundred is at least as good as two and of course, it's reflexive, so that 1 is at least as good as 1, 2 is at least as good as 2, and 100 is at least as good as 100. I have now drawn a reflexive, complete, and transitive relation that makes no sense. But what if it was just the person liked odd numbers, and they'd rather have $1 than 100, and then conditional on being even, they'll take the one that has more money in it, so they'll choose 100 over 2. Reasonable? No. Rational? Yes. It's one of the things that anybody that does any rationalist modeling gets their feelings hurt. It's not fun when somebody deliberately chooses the worst version of your arguments. When one models rationalistly, that's not a word, but when one models rationalistly, they aren't saying that the person only makes reasonable choices saying that there's enough consistency in the choice structure that one could model it. So if nothing else, I'm not telling you to, to buy rationality. If, if anything, I think that you should be a little bit less inclined to buy it because now you've seen a little bit more of what's going on underneath the hood. But I beg of you that if you do in other classes or if you go on to become a political scientist or a lawyer or something where, where rationality might come up, know what you're criticizing. So I want to conclude with a provocative thought. Chewy is my dog. You know him. Chewy likes to play. Uh, he has a favorite ball. And he really likes it when you take the ball and you throw it against the floor hard enough that it bounces a couple of times, which gives him a couple of chances to catch it. He always fails, but he likes to try. God bless him. And so when Chewy tries to catch that ball or in that one in a hundred time that he actually does catch the ball I tried filming this a lot of times and it just isn't going to happen that he's going to catch the ball on, on camera I'm afraid but whenever he catches the ball he's solving a system of 
equations. Right? You could you could model that ball. You could model its path. You probably took some high school physics. You could model the, the, the path of that ball as a function of time in XYZ space. So if you took three real lines and took the Cartesian product, if you had R cross R cross R, it's three-dimensional space, so that every point in space was XYZ, okay? Where that's one is the up down, one is the left right, and one is the depth. And you could model the position of the ball as a function of time with a continuous function, right? And in a sense, when Chewie catches the ball, he is solving a system of equations that takes his position and the ball's position and tries to find a zero point so there's no distance between the two, right? So he's like, I'm going to take the distance between me and that ball, which is a function of time in this weird XYZ space, and I've got calculus happening and, and differential equations and all sorts of crazy things are happening, right? And Chewy is, he's a dog. And I'm going to be honest with you, even among dogs, he's not a smart dog. He does not know calculus, okay? Nevertheless, I can model him catching that ball with a really complicated system of equations. Now, you come to me and you say, but dogs can't do math. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. But I can model him as if he does. The model is an attempt for me to explain what Chewie is doing. It is, me, it is my attempt as an analyst to develop a model for the science of patterns of Chewie catching balls. And for this, you're paying. We don't need the mechanism to work exactly as specified. We just need the people that we study or the countries that we study, or the groups that we study, or whatever, to be consistent enough that we could that we can behave as if they act like we ask them to. That's actually a really subtle but powerful point. It means that we as analysts, so long as we focus enough on verifiable action, so long as we get good enough data on the choices people make, or on Chewie's attempt to catch balls, or whatever, our attempts to model them mathematically aren't hopeless from the very beginning. Of course, mechanisms are important, and we want to know why people make the choices that they make. And that's a very important branch of political science, right? So we, we want to know where people's preferences come from. We want to know why they make the choices that they do. But that doesn't mean that we can't behave as if they live up to one of these three fables. And in fact, the idea that one of the fables, the choice fable, is empirically verifiable is very appealing because it means that if somebody said to you, I don't buy your model, and you have all these untestable assumptions underneath your model, you'd be like, I haven't tested them, but actually some of them are testable. I could, I could check the choice function behavior. I could check to see if people live up to the weak axiom of revealed preference. But that should be how you go about criticizing too. So when you ask important controversial questions about the papers that you read, they should be about the nature of the models. You should meet the models on their own turf. You should say, I understand that rationality is a really hard thing to live up to, but using it as a baseline for behavior and acting as if the people live up to one of the three fables, all of which are equivalent, let me criticize your model on its own terms. That's what you should be trying to do. All this to say, the more that you know about a class of explanations, the more that you know about a literature, or the mo more that you know about a methodological approach within a given discipline, or, about, or a discipline all unto itself, the more that you know, the easier it is for you, hopefully, to live up to the important philosophical principle of charity, which is the idea that you should try to evaluate claims that you hear not from their worst case interpretation, but from their best case interpretation. Whenever you see something that you think you might disagree with, or that you think it's model, you think that the model might be stupid, don't take the worst case version of it as your point of reference. Take the best case version. Assume that the person that wrote down the model is trying to get this right. Assume that they're trying to get to the bottom of something and they're making some assumptions along the way. This principle of charity is a really important thing. I think it's, so if you ask me, if done properly, 
being a scholar can be a way to try to be a good person. I'm not going to tell you too much how to be a good person. And as best as I can tell, being a good scholar can be modeled as if it's a function of virtues. And I think charity is one of the most important of those because our best chance to learn from one another isn't to accept everything that we say to one another at face value, nor is it to reject everything on the grounds of taking uncharitable straw man type interpretations. I hope that you'll consider the principle of charity not just as a way to evaluate mathematical models, but as a way to think about how thoughts emerge in real time. Thanks for watching.